Good evening, everyone. I thank you for coming, and it's great to see you all at our very last lecture of the fourth module, as well as the last lecture of this year. Now, I'm, I'm glad you came today, or tonight, because today, today I'm going to tell you when the second coming is going to occur. <laughs> well, not exactly. Um, we are going to look at the second coming. And um, it brings to a conclusion everything that we have been talking about in Module 4, the big picture. It concludes that big picture that we have been talking about. One of the illustrations that I've used is of a painting, a very, very big painting on a wall. And you and I live in a tiny little hole on that wall. But around us, God is busy painting. He has been painting that picture since the beginning. It was a perfect picture. It was marred by the entrance of sin into this world. And God is in the business of restoring that picture. And he did so by sending Jesus into this world. And ultimately, at the second coming of Jesus, then that picture will be finally complete. And, and that's really, in a sense, what we're talking about tonight as we look at the second coming. Let me remind you of a few scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, we have Jesus' ascension. In a certain sense, I wouldn't blame the disciples if they asked Jesus, why, why are you leaving? Why don't you just stay here and, and do it all right now? Why don't you just announce the eternity or heaven that it's finally arrived? Somewhere in mystery, um, probably veiled from our human eyes, uh, there is the answer why God even now has waited 2,000 years uh, because that's how long it is since Jesus ascended to heaven. But we do have an assurance. Jesus not only told his, his disciples when he was here uh, that he is going to prepare a place for them, but also after his uh, ascension, uh, the disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 10 were looking intently up into the sky as he, Jesus, was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that's the promise. We, we live by this promise and this prophecy uh, that Jesus is going to come back. He himself said so, and uh, that is the expectation that we find written on the pages of the New Testament. We have some sections dealing directly with the second coming. We have plenty of sections in the New Testament, not necessarily mentioning the second coming, but everything mentioned by the authors uh, has been written in the light of the expectation that Jesus was going to come back. When Jesus uh, returned to heaven, he was, according to the scriptures, taken up into glory. And it's interesting the reference to glory, uh, because Jesus received the honor and the glory that uh, were due to him. Uh, that he had with the Father. He's, he prayed that prayer in John chapter 17. Uh, Father, glorify me with the same glory I had when I was with you. And so Jesus anticipated, expected to return to that glorious place. But there's a sense in which the Bible also describes our death here on earth, or if Jesus comes back in our lifetime as being taken up into glory as well. And so in a certain sense, our uh, expectation is also to go and meet with God in glory. And so when Paul writes to the uh, Colossians, to the church at Colossae, he tells them exactly that. He says, so then, and in chapter 2 verse 6, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thank thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And Paul was always careful to point out what the truth is and, and to hold that up against the false doctrines. And people, especially when it comes to the second coming, there are lots and lots of teachings out there that may deceive us, that may take us along, a wrong, along uh, a wrong path. And when Paul uh, prayed for, when he talked to the Colossians, he said to them, 
uh, in chapter 1, and now backing, back, backing up into chapter 1, he says, I have uh, become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints, to them, to the saints. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so Christ is really our hope of glory. And as we will see a little bit later on, Jesus is central to what we believe. In fact, we can't really talk about second coming unless you talk about Jesus first coming. And his first coming anticipates the second coming. And so when you then turn to the book of Revelation, there's a sense in which we then complete that whole picture. And uh, I have often referred to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And then going into chapter 3, which is the fall of mankind. In the light of Genesis 1 and 2, the creation, God created everything and it was very good, said God, says the scriptures, says, says the scripture. And as God looked at this, it was very good. He created mankind in his image. And then he left man, mankind, in the Garden of Eden, in his creation to look after that. We have a perfect picture. We have the picture of mankind in harmony with God because God came and communed with them. They were in perfect harmony with one another. They were in perfect relationship with nature around them. But that picture was marred. That picture was uh, damaged when sin entered into this world. But that picture is busy, uh, God is busy preparing that, uh, repairing that picture. And in the book of Revelation, and just to take one single uh, extract from this uh, book in chapter 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. There's a beautiful picture right there. Uh, I have often, and I, I often even talk to people who are in ministry when, when you look at the church. And In fact, we, we've talked about the church a few weeks ago. And one of the images for the church is that of a bride. And uh, doing weddings, oftentimes I'm, I have the privilege of standing in the front uh, and, and looking at the bride as she comes down the aisle to meet her groom. And uh, mostly, most of the time, in fact, probably all of the time, dressed very, very beautifully and made up and, and just absolutely perfect because she's, she's done this for her groom, for her man, uh, the man in her life. And uh, I have this, this uh, a picture where God has entrusted to us the church, which is His bride and that we need to look after the church. We need to look after the bride of Jesus Christ. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Beautiful picture. Just think about that picture once again on the wall. And God is busy repairing that picture so that this can happen. And John is probably using symbolic language here to paint a picture of God coming back, God coming down. It's an interesting picture because more often than not, we think about going up, we leaving this world and going up. But in that particular picture, it is God coming down and God being with His creation forever in a new, harmonious way. The old order of things has passed away. And there is a new heaven and a new earth. We'll talk a little bit about that later on uh, in our lecture time together. But it's something to look forward to. One of the dangers that I personally experience in my own life is that I don't often think about heaven. I don't think about heaven often enough is perhaps what I should say. Um, and especially when 
things go well. We tend to focus on this world. Our material situation around us is actually quite okay and well, and we don't think, therefore, about heaven. Now, compare that with your Negro spirituals, for example, where slaves worked hard. They didn't have it easy. They were suffering in this world. So what are most of the Negro spirituals about? About heaven. It's about singing about that anticipated future when they will join God, where, where God will be with them and, and, and their situation will be much, much better. And so I think our danger in, in, in our current situation is probably more that we are so earthly minded that we don't really think about heaven that often. And so in this lecture, I would like to take our focus into uh, thinking about what the second coming entails and what it's all about. And so rather than trying to answer every single question about the second coming, um, we are going to deal with some of those issues, theologically speaking. But at the same time, I want to encourage you to, to look for something you can take with yourself that you can apply to your own life. Uh, what is it that God is saying to you tonight through the lecture time and obviously through Scripture as well? And we don't have time to go into all of the Scripture readings tonight, but I encourage you to read more about that. So let's pray together as we get into the lecture. Lord, we thank you for an occasion, a time to come um, where we can study your word. We thank you for all that you have done for us during this time together in this module where we have looked at this big picture, where we have affirmed our faith in you as God the creator, the one who created everything according to your plan and in your wisdom. And we thank you that you've included us in that plan. We thank you, Lord, that we, even when we turned our backs on you, that Jesus came into this world to die for our sins, that the word became flesh and that Jesus died on the cross to make it possible for us to now form part of that picture in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for providing for us during the, the past seven or eight weeks. And we thank you for all that we were able to learn. And I pray that the truths will continue to draw us closer to your side, that it uh, will not just be head knowledge, but that it will help us to live according to your plan, to be holy as you have called us to be. And so, Lord, lead and guide our thoughts even tonight as we deal with sometimes contentious issues and help us to see the bigger picture and to hold on to the main truths in your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at that big picture so far, uh, and right at the end of this lecture tonight, I'm going to give you another summary uh, by way of a statement of faith, um, a very brief, a very generic statement of faith, but it's sort of tying it all together. Uh, but let me remind you that we discussed who God is and um, what He has done, that He created the world, that He uh, re chose to reveal Himself uh, to created mankind, and that mankind was created in God's image, and that sin stepped into this world when mankind rebelled against God and we fell into sin. And therefore, every human being is born into a condition of sinfulness. But God provided salvation not only throughout the Old Testament, which He did do, but also sending Jesus ultimately into this world to come and die for us, to make atonement for our sins and to offer forgiveness so that we can be in a right relationship with God. And then when Jesus ascended to heaven and we, we studied the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the role of the Spirit is to empower us, to live for the glory of God, uh, to give us gifts so that we can serve the church, so that the church can advance, and also to give us the ability to live out the fruit of the Spirit. And, and we therefore need to pray regularly for the Spirit to dwell in us and to fill us on an ongoing basis. The church is God's instrument of taking the kingdom into this world. And uh, we have looked at the church and what it is and how it operates. And we, we then focused very specifically on the mission of the church, which is to take the gospel into the world. We've looked at the massive task before us 
as we look at the unfinished task uh, that still needs to be completed. And we've looked at some statistics around the world, and although they may be about five or six or seven years old, they're still very valid in terms of the big picture around the world. And uh, we have looked at that last week. The final stroke on that canvas is going to be Jesus Christ coming back, and whatever the events around that, this is what we're going to discuss tonight, uh, is going to be looking at how that whole picture is going to be finalized. And when God puts that last uh, stroke on the canvas, uh, then that picture will be uh, complete. So last week, to remind you, we looked at God's mission. We called it Missio Dei, uh, where the church joins God in God's mission. What is God's mission? To reconcile man to God. That is essentially what it's about. To shift people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His marvelous light. Now that task is enormous with um, millions and millions of people around the world who still need to hear the gospel and have access to the gospel. Many have heard and they've rejected the gospel. And in a certain sense, we don't have a responsibility to them, although we will continue to pray for and continue to share the gospel with those people. But there are those around the world who have never even heard the gospel. And that remains a missionary task of the church, an unfinished task that needs to be completed. And whatever that completeness means, uh, scholars disagree on exactly when that task will be completed. Uh, probably when... Uh, everybody around the world has free access to the gospel message. Now tonight we will look at the second coming. Uh, we call it the consummation uh, of the kingdom of God. Uh, God established His kingdom, His rule. Um, sin damaged it. Jesus came to re-establish the kingdom of God and, the, and to recreate us and to uh, recreate the image of God in us. But that will reach final consummation, is a word that we use, to refer to that future event when everything in this earth will be fulfilled according to God's purpose. And so we'll look at the importance of this event. I'm going to try and clarify some of the terms and also raise some of the debates around the second coming. I, I'm not going to give you the answers to all of your questions tonight. I'm, I'm almost convinced of that. Um, but we will take a brief look at some of those uh, issues that people disagree on. And even probably as we sit here, we may have disagreements on that. And then um, we'll take a brief look at eternity, uh, when we look at heaven and hell and, and what that may look like, which is uh, the final destination of man. In terms of the reading, the whole Bible is important to read. So I would encourage you, as I have done regularly, to try and get a reading plan and to read through the Bible. Uh, now, with a little bit more knowledge in terms of how these different themes work together, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Church, uh, mankind, and then the second coming, to read the Bible perhaps from that particular perspective with a, a new uh, knowledge, a new insight into the Word of God. But more specifically, I've referred to Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3. Isaiah chapter 65 is about the new heaven and the new earth. And then in Matthew 24 to 25, we have Jesus' references to uh, some of the end events, and then several other passages in Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22 actually describe that new reality uh, that we uh, talk about. In a certain sense, I'm going to refer to this reality, which is still a sinful reality, although Jesus came, and I am a Christian, and He already dwells in me, and I already have eternal life. I have that absolute assurance in my own life. I have no doubt about that. But then I'm still yearning for a new reality, because sin is still pretty much around us. It's in me, and is around us, and we live in a broken reality uh, where there still is sin and death and illness and all sorts of different problems. But in the new reality, all of the negative things will be taken away by God. When we talk about the second coming, the theological term we use is eschatology. It comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last or last things. And so eschatology means the study of the last things. And you may have heard pastors uh, speak about that from time to time. The Bible is full of the references to the second coming. 
We often refer simply to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But there is also, if you uh, pick up some of the scholarly works, you will find the word parousia, uh, often mentioned by scholars, by theologians, when they refer to the second coming. Again, it's a Greek word, and it means appearance. And uh, more often than not, this is the word used in the Greek New Testament for the coming of Jesus, the parousia, simply the appearance of Jesus. Uh, it has been pointed out that in secular Greek at the time, the word meant the appearance of a king, the coming of a king or of a commissioner or some important person. When that person appears, when that person comes on a visit, then the word parousia is used to refer to that. So the New Testament uses that word to refer to the coming of Jesus. There are other references as well. Um, and we have the day of the Lord, often referred to in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, we have the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. Um, we have the second advent uh, is another word. We, uh, right here at the end of the year, we are in the period of the advent, uh, preparing for Christmas. And uh, the second advent is, is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sometimes simply the day or the last day or the judgment day. And sometimes people refer to the coming again of Jesus Christ. Why is it important? Why do we even talk about the second coming? Well, I think it sort of speaks for itself um, because Jesus created an expectation among his own disciples, his followers, that he was going to come again. The fact that he was here, there was a messianic expectation that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to sit and rule on a throne. He's going to kick out the Romans. He's going to reestablish Israel once again. And, and all of those things were there as, as, uh, as an expectation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, slowly but surely, Jesus changed their understanding of what the Messiah was going to look like. And slowly but surely, they started making the connection with the Old Testament. It was the only Bible they had at the time, was the Old Testament. And so they looked for fulfillments in Jesus Christ of the Old Testament prophecies. That he died, that was something that they never anticipated necessarily. But that he died and that he died for their sins, to forgive their sins, was a, a new concept that, that slowly grew on them. Um, and, and so Jesus said to them, I, I need to go away. John chapter 14, John chapter 16, uh, where Jesus talks about he's going away for the purpose of the Holy Spirit to come, but also to create um, the expectation that he himself is going to come back, uh, as I said earlier on, and that he would be coming back. And uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 11, which we read earlier on, Hebrews chapter 9, 28, there's several other places where uh, the, the early Christians simply expected Jesus because Jesus promised that he was going to come back. They lived with that expectation that it was going to be in their lifetime. And if, if, if not in their lifetime, within a generation or two. Now, we live 2,000 years later. We know that it's now many, many, many generations later. And so, obviously, it has not been fulfilled in their time. And uh, they're, they're, we, we're obviously also very grateful because that means we're included in God's kingdom now uh, because Jesus didn't come back in the first century or the second or the third century. And here we are today in the 21st century and uh, we're still living with that same expectation. But if you go to the New Testament passages that I mentioned in Matthew 24, Acts 10, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, especially the Thessalonian letters, uh, create that expectation that Jesus is coming back. When you turn to the book of Peter, uh, Second Peter in particular, you'll find a little bit of a realism, if I can call it that, creeping in, saying uh, that one day with God is like a thousand years and, one, and a thousand years like one day. So time is not the important thing. And the fact that, that Jesus has yet not come back does not mean that his promise will not be fulfilled. And so I think slowly but surely there was also a, real, a realization that it may not happen in their own lifetime. And although the early Christians had many questions related to the second coming, uh, and I've already referred to the Thessalonian letters, uh, there are many questions related to that. It, it didn't take away the fact that they believed that the second uh, coming was going to happen and that it was going to happen soon. Now, they lived with that expectation, and today, 2,000 years later, we still live with that expectation. There are a couple of things that I want to mention in 
um, in the light of the second coming, maybe temptations that we need to resist. The one temptation is that we discuss the second coming as if it is an, an event completely on its own and unrelated to the rest of Scripture, which is why oftentimes I have gone back to Genesis 1 and 2, and then you can go on. You can go to Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and all the way through Kings and Chronicles and the prophets and into the New Testament. You have to look at the second coming in the light of all of Scripture. You don't take the second coming in isolation and build a whole theory and a whole castle upon that. There, there, there are foundational issues in the Scriptures which anticipate a discussion around the second coming. And because the second coming is something that is in the future, it's difficult for us to have a very clear picture exactly what is going to happen because it hasn't happened yet. And the Bible nowhere has a statement where, we, where any one of the authors says, let me tell you exactly what's going to happen at the second coming. This will happen, point one, point two, three, four, five, and then there's the conclusion. Nowhere in Scripture do you find that which is why we differ on the events around the second coming, because we all go to the Scriptures, we go to all of the Scriptures, and we take little bits and pieces, try and piece it together to build an idea of what the second coming is going to be like. So one of the biggest dangers is that we have a proof text approach. We take a few little Scriptures and we then build a huge theory around the second coming as to exactly what's going to happen. The second and third one I've sort of half alluded to earlier on, um, dangers or temptations, and that is that we get so comfortable in this world that um, really we don't expect Jesus to come back. In fact, uh, we may even want him not to come back because we're so comfortable right now. And there's a real danger that we don't live with an expectation of the future. And then there's another danger, which is the reverse, that we so focus on the second coming that that's all we do. And we even in the Bible in Thessalonians, we have those who so expected the second coming that they resigned their jobs uh, and they were sitting around and waiting for the second coming because that's the only thing that really matters. As if this life and working here and living on earth is not important. And when I look at the scriptures, I find that both living on, on earth and waiting for the second coming, both are actually very, very important. And while I'm here, I need to focus on what God has given me to do, not forgetting that there is a second coming. Um, and so the two inform one another, if you wish. I, because there is a second coming, I live in this world with an expectation of what God wants me to do and how I need to live. When we look at the uh, significance of the second coming in the light of the bigger picture, there is a big picture that we must remember. And we must understand th the teachings around the second coming in the light of all of the Bible. God is busy painting this bigger picture. And He started with creation, and He will bring it to final consummation uh, in the future. But Jesus Christ forms the central focus, the central point of um, this picture. And if you don't see that, whether... Uh, I don't know what sort of picture pops into your mind when I, when I try and describe a big wall. I have a big wall picture in my mind when I look at that. But somewhere in the center of this picture, the cross shines through. Jesus on a, on a throne is somewhere around there. And, and it's, it's that picture that is important because you can never understand anything in Scripture from a New Testament perspective unless you understand it with Jesus Christ as the focal point. And so Jesus' first coming... And what he accomplished with his death and resurrection are the key concepts in understanding what God is busy doing in this world. And we live now in the light of Jesus' first coming and in the expectation of his second coming. And so in that sense, we live in an era where Jesus is absolutely central. And because we have a New Testament understanding, we can now also go back in the Old Testament and begin to read the Old Testament in the light of the coming of Jesus Christ. We cannot ignore the fact that Jesus came. Now, it's also dangerous, and I'm not talking about all the New Testament studies right now. It is dangerous to go back to the Old Testament and read every single little word in the light of the cross and say, there's got to be a cross here, there's got to be Jesus here somewhere. Some of those stories are simply told as God's unfolding plan in, a, in expectation of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Um, but at the same time, having said that, we do have the advantage of looking back at the Old Testament through Jesus who has already come. 
And so it gives us an understanding of our present task, and that is to live for God in the light of Jesus' first coming, but also in expectation that Jesus is going to come back uh, at his second coming. The kingdom of God in this picture, that concept of the kingdom of God plays a very vital role. Kingdom means that there is a king who rules over a particular area or people or a geographical area or whatever. And this is the way Kevin Roy points, uh, points it out or puts it. He says, the theme of God's kingdom runs right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis, we have the promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through the seed of Abraham. The whole Bible traces the development of this idea through the history of Israel until finally in Revelation, we see the consummation of that promise in the new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and the new earth. In that picture that I read in, in Revelation chapter 21, when God comes and He dwells among His people, God is sinful. God now rules. He rules over all of the universe, which He does anyway, but because sin is still present in the world and so much negativity is in the world still, there are certain areas not under the full uh, control or have not bowed to the control of God. But when, when Jesus comes back, all of that will change and everything will be subject to God and God will rule and God will reign. So we've got to understand also the second coming in the light of the kingdom of God theme that we find throughout the Bible. It leads us to... Uh, the concept of the day of the Lord. The people of Israel, and especially, especially in the prophetic books in the Old Testament, expected the day of the Lord to arrive. For them, it was a very positive uh, concept. Uh, God is going to come. He's going to rule. The day of the Lord is when He will deal with all Israel's enemies. The prophets came and changed that picture, picture around again and again. And we've looked at that in the Old Testament when we studied that, uh, when we studied the, the, the prophetic literature. Again and again, the prophet said, you're expecting the day of the Lord to be a positive one. In fact, we are telling you it's going to be a negative one for you. The day of the Lord will be one of punishment uh, for Israel. And of course, also for the nations around. Plenty of, of references to other nations who will be punished by God. So the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. And, and more often than not, we have a, only a negative picture for the word judge. We should have a combined negative and positive picture uh, with the, the, the word judge or judgment. And that is when God judges, God is king and God's word will be final. Now, of course, those who are wrong and sinful will be punished. But God's judgment will also be pronounced on those who are positive, those who are his followers, and those who are invited into the kingdom of God. And then God will judge over them. And in that sense, we need to read the book of Judges. The title Judges means that these people were used by God to rule over the nation of Israel. And in that sense, God is going to be judge uh, ultimately, and God's kingdom will come. Now, the prophets pointed out to Israel that the day of the Lord will be a negative one for them, and several times this was fulfilled uh, when... Uh, when the day of the Lord arrived, either the destruction of Samaria or the destruction of Jerusalem and people going in, into exile, etc. And so there were multiple fulfillments of this prophecy. The day of the Lord came when Jesus came the first time, and there's going to be another fulfillment for the day of the Lord, which is why the New Testament often refers to the second coming as the day, or the day of the Lord is going to come. So there is still a day of the Lord to come somewhere in the future. Don't think 24 hours in one day when the concept day of the Lord is mentioned. Uh, it is an occasion. It's a time when God is going to come and finally deal uh, with this world. Looking at the second coming, I would like to refer to concepts that you probably have heard many, many times before, but just trying to give a bit of meaning and significance and understanding to several of the concepts that we throw around very quickly. Um, and I don't have a particular order here. Um, there's no order of, of importance in the way that I, I share it with you, but, but simply just highlighting some of the concepts and the issues around the second coming of Jesus. The first is that the second coming of Jesus is certain. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is going to come back in power and glory. The first time he came, it was in a stable in Bethlehem. 
in shame uh, and in secret. But this time he is going to come. And the Bible makes the picture very clear that Jesus, when he comes the, the next time, is going to be in power and in glory. And, and here are some of the facts when we look at the New Testament picture. The New Testament has more than 250 clear references to the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm quoting Milne, one of the books that I'm using for this course. He will come on the clouds and every eye will see him. Matthew 24, Acts chapter 1 verse 11 refers to the fact that he's going to come on the clouds. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. He is going to come and every eye will see him. His coming will be with force and sound. So there will be an audible return of Jesus Christ. It's not a, a secret a whipping away of people. People will hear a sound, the loud command, a voice of the archangel and trumpet. Read 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 where, where Paul uses the exact same words. And then Jesus will be revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. Again, I don't associate that with anything that secretly happens behind the scenes somewhere. The Jesus will come in blazing fire, and then he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Now, we still haven't talked about the sequence of events, but I'm just quoting some New Testament uh, passages here to make certain that we know that the, the second coming is going to happen and is going to be accompanied with all of these sounds and visual effects and so forth. Some of the events around the second coming, and here's another quote, the New Testament associates the second coming of Jesus with quite a number of events. The end of this age, the resurrection of the dead, the last judgment, the destruction of the present, the present heavens and earth, and the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth, or the new heaven and new earth. Despite the fact that some biblical scholars want us to make us believe differently, the Bible is just not clear on exactly how it is going to work out. Um, I've already said this, we, we are uh, forced to go to different passages in the Bible to gather information and then to try and piece it together in terms of how it's going to happen, what is the sequence of these uh, events. And as much as we would like to be able to predict more precisely uh, what will happen when, and when it will happen, we have to just admit and humbly admit that we just don't know. In fact, as I stand here before you today, I, I really have to say I don't exactly know. I have views but whether it will work out according to my personal view as I read the scriptures, I, I also cannot say to you emphatically this is the way. And I, um, I've just been uh, on the internet, again, just reading up on some of the, the ways that people explain the second coming. And I find it quite amazing that people can be absolutely emphatic, this is it. I mean, all the way down to precise predictions of the day of when it's going to happen. Now, that's an extreme, and most of us reject that, uh, and most of Christianity rejects the fact that, uh, we, we, uh, that, that there is going to be a specific, well, there will be a specific day, but when is going to be? But people have even gone so far as to predict days, and there have been plenty of those uh, in history. We also talk about resurrection um, when we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. At the coming of Jesus, the dead in Christ and that is Christian believers who have died here on earth, will rise first. And that is according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Then all believers, dead and alive, will meet Christ in the air. And we'll talk about uh, the rapture in a moment, but that is the verse that people use for the rapture. Now, if you believe in the rapture, some people don't, but some do. If you believe in the rapture, this is the reference, and that is that, that Christians will meet Jesus in the air. Now, I personally don't have a problem with that, but if that is what is meant by rapture, I don't have a problem with that. It is what happens next that creates the confusion, and that is they meet Jesus in the air. Do they go with Jesus up or do they go with Jesus down? That is essentially what it boils down to. Um, and, and, and that is where, where people start differing from one another in terms of their views. And we'll look at some of those views later on. Now, it's interesting when you, look, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
that Paul has a long chapter on resurrection, essentially about Jesus' resurrection. But he uses Jesus' resurrection to prove the fact that we will also rise from the dead and that we will be clothed with a new body. And he has another picture of that in another passage where he talks about his own longing uh, to leave, he calls it a tent here on earth, his, his current body, to be clothed with a new body, a new version of the body. Just as Jesus rose with a resurrected body, a glorified body, but he was still recognizable, in the same way we will also be clothed with a new body. Now whether that happens at the second coming of Jesus and we're still alive, or whether it happens when we die here and maybe 100 or 200 years later Jesus comes back, uh, every Christian will rise from the dead or clothed with a new body and then meet Jesus in the air. Scholars also differ and disagree with one another uh, on whether there is going to be one or two resurrections at the end. And uh, again, you'll see it later when we talk about the millennium, but you'll see uh, immediately, even when I read this, you will, you will see the, the difference or the, the difficulty. And in Revelation uh, 20 verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been uh, beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads uh, or their hands. So they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. In other words, there is implication here that there is a second resurrection. And you'll see later on how people differ on whether there's one resurrection of Christians or whether there's a first resurrection and then later on a second resurrection of Christians. Uh, and, and that means that, that scholars actually move in different directions when they interpret that. Another concept that I want to just introduce to you is the, is the reference to the last days. The concept of the last days is found in several places in the Bible. It has different meanings depending on the context, um, but it can refer to the time of God's judgment, immediate judgment or future. The last days in, um, in Jerusalem um, in 590 refer to those last few years before the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 by the Babylonians. So obviously there's a, an immediate fulfillment, the last days of Jerusalem. It can also refer to the last days before the first coming of Jesus. It can refer to the coming of Jesus, his first coming, but it can also refer to the period, the era that you and I live in right now. The last 2,000 years since the coming and the, the ascension of Jesus until his second coming, refer, those years refer to the last days that we live in. There is also reference to uh, the, the sin in the world that will increase and, and uh, the struggles and persecution uh, that, we, that we undergo or that Christians undergo will be on the increase and therefore the last days before the second coming is another possible reference here. So there are multiple references when we talk about the last days and you need to read very carefully when you go to the Bible. Not every single reference to the last days means the last few years or days or whatever it is before the second coming of Jesus. Uh, in the New Testament, most of the references are to the era that we live in, all the way from the first century right to our uh, uh, days as well, the years that we live in. Now, living in the last days, believers throughout the years have carefully watched uh, the signs of the times, and that's another way in which it's referred to um, when, when the signs are there. And Jesus referred to those signs. Um, using several illustrations such as the tree, when it buds, and, and so on. And, and you need to be aware of those signs, uh, is what Jesus said. And many people have interpreted world events in that light. You can imagine uh, when you have a change of uh, an era, or you have a world war, or people are being heavily persecuted in one particular part of the world. You can imagine that they believe that they live in the last days, because that's what they, what they are suffering 
uh, and the, the yearning, as Paul did at one stage, to just be with Jesus. Uh, and he explains that to us in, in, in the uh, letter that he wrote to the Philippians. Uh, and so you can see that people live in the last days and especially are aware of the last days when they are persecuted. As we know, uh, up to this point in time, Jesus has not yet returned. That's why we are here. Otherwise, we may have been left behind, uh, which I don't think has happened. But um, you can imagine through, through all the 2,000 years gone by that people often thought, this is it. These are the last days. But they still haven't arrived. I have sometimes difficulty personally when I think about these things because um, I, I often hear people say, you know what, we hear about so many earthquakes nowadays or so many disasters around, this must be the last days. Uh, I want to take their thoughts back to the world wars, for example, when millions of people died and it must have been for the people then the last days. We live in better conditions now than just not long ago uh, during this, the Second World War. Things were horrific in this world when millions and millions of people were killed. And there were several of those times during history. So I'm very cautious when I start interpreting world events to say, this, these are the last days. I believe we live in the last days, and we have lived in the last days since the first century. And so in that sense, the day of the Lord and the, and the last days are very similar. We live in the time uh, of uh, the uh, of the last days. Now, of course, you came here tonight to uh, have the Antichrist identified for you. Um, the Antichrist, when we look at biblical references, who is this figure that we call the Antichrist? Shrouded in mystery, we uh, we're not told in so many words exactly who it is or what it refers to, and I believe that we will do well if we stay within the Scriptures and, and really just, first of all, determine what it is that the Bible says about the Antichrist. Let me give you two facts. The first one is that the word Antichrist occurs only in 1 John, in chapter, chapter 2, verses 18 to 23, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and in 2 John 7. In other words, John, in his letters, is the only one who refers and uses this word Antichrist, And it comes from a, a combination of anti, which means against, and Christos, which is Christ. So against Christ. And when you carefully read through John, very clear that John is saying that anybody who is against Jesus Christ is, in that sense, carrying the spirit of the Antichrist. In fact, he refers, he uses that very reference, that the spirit of the Antichrist is already around. And I have no doubt that he's referring to false doctrines in his day and time, 2,000 years ago already. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in that passage um, in, in uh, verses 1 to 12, Paul refers to the man of lawlessness. He does not use the word antichrist. Or he refers to the lawless one. Possibly another reference to the antichrist. And most scholars make the connection. And I have personally no problem in making the connection because Paul refers to the man of lawlessness, and it seems to be a figure. Now, when you start talking about the Antichrist and try and identify him, uh, we have to again bear in mind a few things. The first is that there may be a single figure in the future, but as John points out, the spirit of the Antichrist was already present in the first century. And he talks about Antichrists, in fact, in the plural. And uh, we have to bear in mind that um, it, it may be on the increase and there may be, and I want to say maybe, some people will say there definitely will be um, a figure at some point in time. Um, and, and now people don't necessarily all agree. Is it a person, one single individual person? Is it a force? Is it a political force? Is it a country? Uh, is it a movement? And, and people have all sorts of solutions uh, for that. And antichrists are those who deny that Jesus is God. And in that sense, my well-behaved neighbor who doesn't believe in Jesus and who denies that Jesus is God is an antichrist. Because the spirit of the antichrist is at work in my unbelieving neighbor who doesn't accept that Jesus is God. Um, and does it refer even to some religious movements who claim that Jesus is never God and he isn't God? And when you go to 1 John... 
it is very clear if you deny Jesus, then you have the spirit of the Antichrist, or you may even be the spirit of the Antichrist. And here's a, a very scary thought, and that is that the Antichrist may come, and probably in John's case, came from the church. Uh, and this is the way John refers to that. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, John says in verse 18, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the, the Antichrist is coming, and that is the po possible reference to an individual or a figure at some point in the future, is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. They already exist. This is how you know, how we know that it is the last hour. That's the first century, which is why I, ref why I say to you, the last days, the last hour, uh, refer to the last days, and that is the days that we are living in, not meaning uh, in the 2000s, uh, but I mean in the 2000 years gone by. They, the Antichrists, went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. And then he goes on from there to talk about the anointing we have in us and making a comparison between the Antichrist and the anointing uh, that we have. And so it is possible um, that John is referring to false teachings. In other words, he's not talking about people who come dressed like the devil. He's talking about those who are dressed like Christians. They look like Christians, but they aren't. And that's what John is saying. And they started twarting, twisting the truth and they have moved out from the church, and they now oppose the church, and it's even more dangerous than someone coming in and saying, you must deny that Jesus is, is God, or you must deny Jesus, He never existed, or something. But if they twist it just ever so slightly, uh, then it's even more dangerous, and I can, I can uh, guarantee you that we are going to see more and more false teachings, um, because people infiltrate the church, and then they twist the truth, and they, they just move away, and they have a huge following oftentimes, uh, creating many false doctrines. The number 666 is another concept we have associated with the end times or the last days. This number and speculations as to whom it pro uh, refers to uh, has kept Christians busy for ages. Now, the reference, and this is something you also need to understand from a biblical point of view, only occurs in connection with the evil force in Revelation chapter 13. Never in any other place do we have a reference to the number 666 in reference to anything else. And there it's a, um, a reference to an evil force, uh, the beast, and uh, it has the number 666. And John says in Revelation 13 that those who are wise will be able to figure it out. What is he referring to? Well, we're not 100% sure. And even if people claim to be sure, I already have my doubt. The moment someone says it must be Henry Kissinger, uh, it must be uh, Hitler, it must be, then I, I step away from that because I don't believe we are certain as to exactly what it is. May there be multiple fulfillments of this. It, it possibly is true. Is it a reference to the Antichrist? Um, and there are those who believe that the word Nero when you, when you look at the numerical value of the letters in the word Nero, which goes even way before John, that's uh, 30 years or so earlier on, um, when he ruled and reigned as emperor, that it, it calculates all the way up to 666. So it's possible that in history we've had uh, several 666s already, as we have had several antichrists, and I'm only quoting John, already. And uh, will it be that there will be another one and those who are wise, who will be able to work it out, uh, may be able to identify that person. But is it, is it definite? Is it a definitive person? Or is it a force? Or is it a general spirit of Antichrist that we are referring to? Again, we're not sure. And Christians don't have to live in fear. And I, I remember growing up even that there were times when I was afraid <laughs> that we may see the 666 and they're not going to engrave my hand or something on my forehead or uh, plant a little thingy under my skin or something like that. And people 
uh, uh, stocking up food uh, in their basements and all sorts of things. I don't, I don't believe it's, it's necessarily correct to do that. I think we live in the presence of God and Christians don't fear. We don't even fear persecution. It's probably not nice to have persecution. I'm not going to invite it into my life and say, here I am, please come and persecute me. But if it does come, um, then I think we don't have anything to fear. And God's Spirit will enable us to even live through that. We have to live, therefore, in the victory of the second coming. Jesus' return will mark His final victory over His enemies. And this is described in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, and other places, for example. And all those who do not know Christ, those who reject Him along with the evil forces of darkness, will be destroyed in that last and final battle. Now, part of that battle has already taken place. When Jesus conquered the devil on the cross, and when Jesus rose from the dead, He conquered the evil and the devil. And therefore, we don't have to live in fear. But there is going to be a final consummation of all of that. Uh, and I've used this word consummation a few times, but even in the context of battle, I believe there's a final battle that is coming, uh, which will bring it all to a conclusion, and everybody evil will be uh, away from God's presence. Satan and his followers will be bound and thrown into the lake of fire. Victory is in Christ and in Christ alone. Uh, Kevin Roy says the book of Revelation also relates how each and all of these enemies one after the other, are defeated by the risen Lord and cast into the lake of fire. Paul teaches that the man of lawlessness, Antichrist, will be overthrown and destroyed by the Lord Jesus at His glorious coming again. And the last enemy to be, to be destroyed is death. Death is still an enemy, um, but there's a first death, there's a spiritual death, there's a physical death, and a spiritual death. We don't have to fear either. Uh, there's an uncertainty when it comes to physical death for all of us. We're certainly not inviting death into our lives and say, I want to die. Uh, but we are not, uh, we're not concerned because we know that victory is in Christ. So even if I die in this world, I know that the second death, as Revelation refers to that, has no power over me because I live in Jesus and in the victory of Jesus Christ. We're going to take a break and then uh, we'll talk about the time of the second coming and when we come back. Okay, welcome back. We're going to uh, talk about the time of the second coming. There have been numerous calculations, despite the fact that Jesus said that no one knows, not even the Son of Man, when he was here. Another bit of a mystery when it comes to Jesus and, and his ability, or abilities when he, when he was a human being, but it seems like this is one ability that he willingly laid down when he became a human being. So at the time, he didn't know. And of course, it leads to a bit of a, a theoretical discussion as to whether the son now knows, which personally I think he does, because he no longer is uh, in, in, on earth in his human body. But then, of course, times of difficulty uh, always increase the expectation. Uh, we have lived through the change of a millennium uh, from the 1900s to 2000. And I still remember all the hype around that particular stage. And the exact same thing happened with the turn of the millennium when it was from uh, uh, the first millennium to the second. And um, it creates a, a heightened awareness of times. Uh, there's, there's almost something in the air at that particular stage. And then people start making all those kinds of predic predictions. Needless to say, uh, if people have a date that they give, those are false teachings. I don't even give a second thought to those. Uh, just today, again, I, I looked on the internet. Uh, you, can get, you can get it at uh, Wikipedia, but there's several other sites where they will give you the dates that have been um, used as predictions for the second coming, all the way from the first century right down to our modern age. And there are a few more dates still to come. Uh, 2012 is another one, um, and then 2020 or 2027 or something. I mean, there are all sorts of dates, and uh, that despite the fact that we just don't know when the second coming is going to happen. When we talk about the second coming, I've referred to God as a judge or Jesus as judge as well. There are references to the judgment of the world uh, in all of Scripture. Sometimes God judges his enemies, um, and we read about that in Deuteronomy 32, verse 41. 
uh, Israel's enemies, uh, Egypt and others around Israel, were often the focus of judgment oracles by the prophets, uh, the prophetic literature. And then God judged Israel. When Israel went wrong, God did not refrain from judging his own nation. And then there is clear reference to the fact that there is a, an anticipated judgment day that is still coming. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul refers to Jesus uh, when he returns to this world. He will judge the world. Everyone, both good and bad, will appear before the great white throne. That's another way this day or this occasion is referred to in the scriptures and in theology around the second coming. Um, and everybody will be judged on the basis of their, first of all, their belief in Jesus Christ. But there also seems to be a judgment for, even for Christians, based on uh, what they have done in this world and what they have done with their belief um, in Jesus Christ. The unrighteous will be condemned, while believers will be rewarded. And it's especially in the light of the word reward um, that we have the idea that, that different Christians will receive different kinds of rewards when it comes to heaven. Again, it's a mystery. We're not exactly sure how that's going to pan out. The Bible is not 100% clear on that particular issue. The signs of the second coming, I've alluded to this earlier on. But Jesus told his disciples to watch out for the signs of his coming. <clears throat> uh, but at that same time, or at the same time, he warned them to be careful about false announcements and that people will come and say, uh, here is the Messiah, there's the Messiah, we've seen him, or uh, he has arrived. And Jesus said, don't be fooled by that, um, but you will know and uh, there are signs. Now, uh, judging from the past 2,000 years, it may be very difficult for us to really say with any amount of certainty exactly when those signs are coming to fruition. There is already reference in the Bible and through all the 2,000 years to the earthquakes and the wars and uh, people have been at war, the world has been at war, sometimes more than other times. And even right now there are several wars going on around the world. And, and so it's difficult to really, really judge uh, based on uh, history based on the last 2,000 years to say uh, things are on the increase right now. Are they or are they not? Uh, they certainly have been a lot worse at some stages in history uh, and it probably will get a lot worse. But the key here is not to sit and watch and study the world events so that we can be ready. We should be ready regardless. Uh, and so even if there's total peace, in fact there's one indication where it seems like when people say peace or peace and they think now the world is at peace with one another, then the end will come, it seems like. And so it's very difficult to judge based on the signs around or how to interpret those signs. And then, of course, there is the place of Israel. And um, here is really um, a point where Christians and scholars go in different directions. The place and the role of Israel in the continued plan uh, of, of God as it, as it uh, unfolds, uh, that is, has always been and it will remain a controversial issue. Uh, you can imagine after World War II with a heightened expectation of the second coming. I mean, in the light of not, not just rumors of war, but the whole world was virtually at war. And, and pretty soon after that, the state of Israel is declared, 1948, and, and you can imagine the writings, um, and if you just go on the internet and read some book and books that have been published around that time, you'll find huge um, uh, descriptions of how the prophecy has been fulfilled, and that now that Israel is a nation again and the Jews are returning to Jerusalem, now the time is that Jesus is going to come back. And so it's, it's again one of those very, very controversial issues where Christians disagree about whether God still has a plan for Israel, the, the ethnic nation of Israel, or not. And um, then you have all sorts of different words that people use, words such as the church has replaced Israel. Some people refer to that as the replacement theology. Uh, others say, uh, no, Israel has not been replaced. Israel has been parked for a little while. Uh, until the time of the Gentiles has served its full purpose, then God will go back to the ethnic nation of Israel and because he has another uh, purpose for them. My point of departure is that we need to look at the eternal plan of God. 
uh, when I read the New Testament, it's very clear to me that God had a plan even before the creation of the world. And that God is busy planning everything towards the end of this world. And, and to bring it all to that word again, consummation. And um, I believe that's where God is heading. And it's one single plan. It's not two different plans. And so any theology that creates the impression that God has two different sets of plans, He's got one for Israel and another one for the church, uh, I believe those are wrong and they may even lead to false uh, theologies or doctrines. Uh, there, I believe there's only one single plan in the mind of God. How God will deal with Israel is, is a difficult one uh, that we don't have all of the answers. Uh, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul has something to say about Israel, but even then, very difficult to predict precisely uh, based on what Paul says in those chapters on what exactly is going to happen. There is one single thing that I do want to highlight, and I know I'm not giving you many answers on the, uh, the position of Israel. I have my own views on that, uh, but I'm not giving you all the answers. But I do believe one thing, and that is Jesus is central, and that is whether it is an Israel, Israelite or a Jew or a, a Gentile or a South African or whoever it is, Jesus is central. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He died for our sins. There is no other way of getting to God. And even if the temple, a third temple is built and the sacrificial system is reinstalled, that is not the way to God. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that would make complete nonsense of the New Testament and Jesus coming and dying on the cross. If there is another way for a Jew or for any other person, then Jesus died for nothing. It would have been better for him not to come and die. And so I'm very clear on that particular issue. So whatever your view is on Israel, ethnic Israel, the one thing you should get clear in your mind is that, that anybody should come to God through Jesus Christ. We talk about the Great Tribulation, and there's lots of talk about the Great Tribulation. The reference to the, or a, or the Great Tribulation occurs only in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, but there are many other references to trials and hardships uh, and persecutions that will happen uh, and that Christians, the followers of Jesus, will be persecuted and that they will go through hardships. Now, scholars holding different views around the second coming uh, also therefore hold different views as to the role of the, of the tribulation. There are those who believe that tribulation means generic uh, and generally through all the ages and that, that it may be on the increase, but that the tribulation actually started already because Christians are being persecuted around the world even right now. Uh, and then there are those who say, no, but there's a very special tribulation that is coming. It's going to be a hectic time. Um, there may be a seven-year period. Uh, and so obviously your view of the second coming and the events around the second coming also determine uh, determines your view of the tribulation and what you believe around the, the tribulation. We'll talk about some of those views in a moment. Then the word rapture, and I have referred to this earlier on, so let me make a, a few comments. When we use the word rapture in eschatological terms, uh, it is an English word that, that, uh, that is used to um, refer to the Latin word. It comes from Latin that means rapture or that is raptus, uh, taken from the Vulgate in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. In the Greek, this word is harpazo, which means to be caught up or to be taken away. And that is literally all it means. But obviously, based on the Latin, the word rapture has been formed around that. And so a whole theology around the rapture has developed. In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Paul states that believers will meet Jesus in the air when he comes. Now, that is an interesting thing, um, and, and, and there are different views. And as I said to you earlier on, uh, are Christians going to meet Jesus in the air because he's coming to fetch them and then take them out of this world with him to heaven? Or is Jesus coming and some Christians, or not some, Christians are coming to meet him, to lead him into the world? So literally, does rapture mean taking Christians out and away from the world? Or does it mean meeting Jesus in order to come back to the world, to the earth? And so you can see, uh, in my own personal opinion, the Bible is not 100% clear. Uh, in fact, Paul doesn't say anything beyond that. It may be good for us just to uh, read that very briefly uh, or quickly and, um, and look at that reference of the Apostle Paul. Um, 
1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's the word caught up um, or uh, raptured. Together with them, with those who have risen from the dead, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And therefore encourage each other with these words. Now, he doesn't say whether we will be with the Lord in heaven or we'll be with the Lord on earth. He doesn't actually say. So it's very difficult to determine from that particular reference whether we will leave this earth and be in heaven or meet Jesus and bring Him and, and come with Him back to this earth immediately. And you can see how uh, Christians uh, differ on that particular issue. The one thing I do want to say is that I personally, and I'm, I'm speaking purely personally, I don't see in the Bible any evidence of a secret rapture of Christians leaving the rest of the world here to continue to live uh, for another little while with the option of some people still then coming to Christ and to know Jesus, and, and only then the end comes. Um, I, I, I personally don't see that in Scripture, uh, but I know that I disagree with many people on that particular issue, and that is fine. The millennium. And, and again, um, the millennium uh, leads to many different versions and views around this. Millennium means a thousand years and a thousand years of peace according to the Bible. The Bible refers to this time of peace that will arrive for God's people and for the world. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 11 already, way back in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 35 as, as another reference to this peaceful time when lion and lamb will lie together and there will be peace um, in the world. Most scholars see this as a depiction of what Christ came to do, and that is, first of all, to bring spiritual peace. But then the views differ dramatically when it comes to the ultimate meaning of the, of the physical thousand years. Are we talking about a literal thousand years, Jesus reigning on this earth, and after that the end will come, or uh, is there no such reference in the Bible to that. And then, where does Israel fit into that picture? And this is where the different pictures go uh, in different directions. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, verse, verses 1 to 3, we have the only reference to the concept of a thousand years of Christ's reign of peace. It makes it very difficult because um, the book of Revelation, we know, oftentimes uses, in fact, more, more often than not, uh, use a symbolic language. Is it a symbolic reference to the time of peace? Uh, is it a literal thousand years? Uh, will Jesus reign on earth for a thousand years? And only then will the end come. Uh, and so Christians disagree on that. Around that there are four views, essentially, maybe even three, but, but uh, let, me, let me use four, and there are variations of each of these views. The first one is what is known as historic premillennialism, and this view dates back to the early church that held that Jesus is going to come back, as I have explained. Christians will meet Jesus in the air. They will come back to the earth with Jesus, and then Jesus will reign for a thousand years here on earth, and only then will there be a second resurrection and the great white throne and people will then be judged, and people will then be sent to, to hell and to heaven after that. That's essentially what that means. And I'm going to draw a little line on the board just to give you an idea. So we are living since the time of Jesus Christ, and uh, the premillennial view um, means that Jesus is coming back, and uh, he is going to then be met with the Christians or by the Christians in the air. They all come back. And from this point on, there is going to be a thousand years of reign, and then the end, the final end will come, and then people will be sent to heaven and hell uh, and so forth. 
So that's premillennial. In other words, before the thousand years, Jesus is coming back. Part of the difficulty with this, we're then talking about two comings back, if you wish. They're, they're two different occasions uh, of the coming back uh, of Jesus. So those are some of the difficulties. Um, but I, I, I will point out some of the difficulties with the others as well. There is a view uh, that says that um, there is no millennium, and that is called a millennialism, and that Jesus, when he came the first time, um, came to die for our sins, and he introduced the millennial time, the, the time of peace. And somewhere in the future, Jesus is simply going to come back. The great white throne will happen, and people will go off in different directions, hell and heaven. And I'm, I'm summarizing, but that's essentially what it means. There is no real millennium. We're not talking about a physical a reference to a thousand years. It's a spiritual reference. It's a time period. It's a time of peace. Uh, the argument goes that um, as Christians, we have received Jesus' peace in our hearts. Uh, Non-Christians don't experience that peace. The thousand, the millennium, really refers to the peace that I have as a Christian, and I'm expecting Jesus' return. The positive of this is we only have to really deal with one coming. We do, it doesn't become very complicated. Uh, the, the complication is the fact that many people say, well, where's the peace you're referring to? This world has no peace. We're still living in a, pretty much in a time when there's a lot of sin and problems and issues. Then there is a variation of premillennialism. It's a, probably the most popular one at this stage, and it's called dispensational premillennialism. And Jesus came and he died, and Somewhere in the future, um, when after the, the, the signs of the times are there and so on, the Christians are going to be raptured. This is the secret rapture. There's going to be probably a seven-year period of tribulation. That is, again, divided in the middle by three and a half. It goes back to the book of Daniel. Lots of uh, overlay Daniel Revelation and putting a lot of pictures together. We're trying to combine all the different pictures. And then Jesus is going to come back um, as with the premillennial view. And at this point in time, he's going to come back. The Christians will meet him in the air. He is going to reign on earth then for a thousand years, at the end of which there's going to be great white throne, judgment, and people will be going in the different directions. Now, let me tell you that this view is not old. It is very new. It only started in the beginning of the 1800s, the first time that there's any reference to this particular view, which is why I'm personally, one of the reasons why I'm very critical of it, uh, because it's only about two, 300 years old. In fact, two, only over 200 years old. Um, before that, there's no evidence of this secret. This is the secret rapture sort of view. The unfortunate thing here is that the whole left behind series of books and, and movies based on this view. And uh, part of my difficulty with that is create a huge amount of fear of being left behind. Um, whereas I believe that based on the scriptures, I can be very, very certain of my faith and my belief in Jesus. Even as I was growing up, there were times when I feared that uh, back then going to the movie theater was wrong, it was sin. So if, if Jesus came back while I was in the movie theater, I would be left behind. And then I would have to go through the seven years of tribulation, and will I be able to make it, uh, and so on. So it left me with a huge amount of fear uh, as I was growing up. And so this is, this is a danger that some views around the second coming may create more fear than they create real expectation and anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. There is another view, and it's called post-millennialism, when Jesus came, he introduced the millennium. Um, it's, there's similarities between amillennialism and post-millennialism, but with one major difference, and that is the world is going to be increasingly better, becoming better and better. And when it is almost perfect, Jesus is going to come back. And that is post the millennium. So at the end of the millennium, Jesus is going to come back. That is the view held by post-millennialism. Um, there are very few supporters of this particular view. It was a very optimistic view, also a very sh uh, sh um, uh, young, 
um, view started in the 18, 1900s with the Enlightenment, where people said we are coming of age, and around that whole time, people were very optimistic that the world is now becoming a better place. And so you can see that behind this view is uh, in the thousand years of rain is going to become more and more peaceful, and then Jesus is going to come back. Uh, but because of the realism, uh, there is no longer much support for this particular view. Now, we've been talking about the second coming, the signs, the tribulation, and all sorts of things. I have not given you many answers to probably many of your questions. I do that deliberately because of the variety of different views around the second coming, which I don't want to highlight. I personally believe it's very, very difficult for us to stipulate exactly what is going to happen when. Uh, and by the way, the... Uh, the uh, premillennial dispensational view, dispensational premillennial view, uh, has the whole history divided into dispensations. So most of the scholars around this or people around this view divide the whole history in seven uh, time periods. And uh, we are right now in the time, the dispensation of the Gentiles. Israel plays a major role in that view. So Israel is parked at the moment, because God's not dealing directly with them. But once the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled, that dispensation for the Gentiles then is over, and God will then turn His attention again to Israel, and all of Israel will come in mass uh, to Jesus, and they will then become Christians um, and be saved in that way. So they, they're really, in a certain sense, two different paths that God is, is, is working. One is with the Gentiles, the other one is with Israel. And, and I'm oversimplifying the whole thing because there are many variations of all of those views, uh, but trying to give you a little bit of, uh, of an overview of that. Now, when we talk about the second coming, it, introduced, it introduces to us heaven and hell, eternity, if you wish. And the Bible refers to a new heaven and a new earth. And I hope to stimulate your thinking tonight with some thoughts around heaven. Because I do believe that we have wrong views about heaven. Uh, most of us, we die or Jesus will come back and he'll take us to heaven. And we're going to be up there somewhere. Uh, and I believe it's actually the other way around. I think Jesus is coming back and we are going to be down here. Because God's going to join us here uh, on this earth. But um, I'm one step ahead of myself. Isaiah chapters 65 and 66 um, were the first to mention the new heaven and the new earth uh, that, was, uh, that were going to be established by God. This will be characterized by peace. There will be plenty and peace will be there uh, in this new reality. It's Peter in his letters who pick up on the same theme, teaching that a new earth and a new heaven uh, would emerge after the destruction of the present earth. Um, and, and this is also one of the debates among scholars, whether this earth will be completely destroyed, in other words, burn up and gone, and then God will create a brand new heaven and an earth. And those who believe that God, what He created, is good, and He will then leave it essentially intact, but He will recreate His own creation. In other words, make it new. He will renew it. And, and it's not always easy. When you look at Peter seems like what is here will go up in flames completely, and then something brand new will be introduced. When you look at other passages in the Bible, it looks like God will recreate, in other words, take the existing earth and heaven and recreate it to fulfill His purposes. Now, Revelation chapter 21 then contains a beautiful picture of the new heaven, the new earth, this new reality. Um, this is the final and perfected state of the kingdom of God, spoken of by Moses and the prophets. This is the everlasting kingdom in which the saints will reign with Christ forever and ever. This is eternal life. This is the fullness of life and the glory and the presence of God. And uh, that last part is a quote from Kevin Roy's notes. When we talk about hell, Christians have always understood the scriptures to teach that the unrighteous, the, uh, the ungodly, uh, will be condemned to hell. After the judgment, they are the goats, and they will be sent away from the presence of God. And um, they will go to a God-forsaken place of everlasting punishment. And if you want to have a good definition of hell, it's a place where God is not. Now, even, even on earth, 
we, even despite all the sin, God is still present because God is still in control. If God's presence is withdrawn completely, you have hell. Now, that's not the only picture we have in the Bible. We have hell described as fire and brimstone and suffering and everything else. Uh, whichever picture is clear in your mind, it is the place that is totally God-forsaken and it will be eternal punishment. Now, some scholars uh, believe that hell in the Bible refers to the annihilation of uh, the unrighteous. They will be judged, they will be punished, they will be beaten maybe even, they will be chucked into hell, but hell means everlasting death. In other words, they will be annihilated, they will no longer exist. Um, most conservative scholars don't believe that that is the case, but that uh, hell is a place of existence. It's not non-existence. It's a place where people exist and where they will suffer eternally uh, without the presence of God. Now, the physical location of hell is not known to us. In the minds and the worldview of ancient people, there were three layers of existence. There is heaven and there is earth and there is hell. So hell is always down and heaven is always up. Um, so it's just those three realities. But of course, uh, from a more modern scientific point of view, when you have a round earth and you have a universe that is so big, uh, does it mean that hell is, is down and does it mean it's in the center of this earth? Um, that, that is not clear. Now where, where this, this hell is, where hell is, is not clear to us whatsoever. So it doesn't even help to speculate around that. Then, of course, there is the age-old question, what happens to Christians when they die? In fact, what happens to people when they die? And um, this is, again, open for debate, um, but my current belief is that there is an, what I would call an interim heaven or an intermediate heaven. And so when my mom passed away and she was a wonderful Christian, she went to be with Jesus, and she is in heaven, and that is heaven where God dwells right now. But right now, heaven and earth are not combined. Heaven is a different place. That is where God is. And so when a person dies on this earth right now, a Christian, that person goes to be with, with Jesus. Now, the exact conditions of that is very difficult to determine, even from the Scriptures, what that means right now. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how that happens, but some, somehow or the other, they continue to exist. It means that they go to heaven. Paul, when he spoke to the Philippians, wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, he clearly had uh, in his mind a debate as to whether it's better to go or to stay. And, and he said, well, actually, it's better for me ultimately to go, because if I do, I will be in the presence of Jesus. He doesn't talk about a time of silence or sleep uh, or uh, a soul sleep as it has become known uh, by some. Some people believe that when you die, you go into either Sheol or Hades, and it's a, it's a waiting room sort of thing, and all the souls go to a place where they wait. Um, but it sounds to me, it looks to me like when I read the scriptures that people, when they die, are immediately in the presence of God or immediately in some form of punishment. When I look at that story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus, it seems like they were immediately in their final places of final destination without the final judgment having taken place. That is still some future event. So somewhere in the future, those people will rise and then appear before God and the great white throne and only then will the final separation take place. Your destination is already clear and final, but the judgment will make it very clear and why you end up where you do end up, whether it's in heaven or uh, in hell. There is also a view um, held by some Orthodox and Catholic churches uh, that there is a state of purgatory and that is, if you are a total sinner and an ungodly person, your destination is hell, full stop. If you are a good, solid Christian and you have served the Lord, then your destination is heaven, full stop. However, there is an intermediate state. Those who are Christian, but they haven't lived up to the Christian life. And when they die, they can, through the prayers of saints over here, through purgatory, be, they can be cleaned and cleared 
to ultimately at the great white throne, they can be cleared and then they can go to heaven one day. There is absolutely no uh, proof of that in Scripture anywhere. It's a doctrine that arose um, and there is no, no proof of that. What is heaven going to be like? Well, I'm sure we all wonder, but we do have some pictures uh, of heaven. I want to encourage you to get a, get a hold of a book by Randy Alcorn, A-L-C-O-R-N, and it simply has the title, Heaven. And it is really an eye-opener. If you have this idea that you are going to go to heaven and drift on a little cloud and play a harp for eternity, uh, some of us can't play the harps anyway. Uh, so it may be a nightmare for many uh, where, if that is the picture in your mind. But the, the Bible seems to refer to the new reality as a continuation of the old, but a renewed old, if you wish. In other words, a new heaven. So even the reference heaven, there's an old heaven, but there's a new heaven. Earth. There's an old earth, but there's going to be a new earth. And when I read the book of Revelation in particular, it seems like heaven and earth will combine. And in a certain sense will be one. In fact, I read that in Revelation chapter 21, where the new Jerusalem will, will come down and God will be present. And we live in this new reality on earth where God will dwell. And there's no longer need for a temple because God will be everywhere present and there will be peace uh, and so on. And so it's going to be a physical place. We're not going to be souls drifting around. We will have bodies. We will live. And, and this may be the bad news. We will work. Um, and for some people that is bad news. <laughs> But there will be some familiar things such as work and eating and drinking and singing and water of life and the fruit of trees. All of those symbols or imagery uh, is used, uh, are used in the book of Revelation in the Bible. And so some very familiar things are going to happen in heaven uh, one day or in this new reality. The impact and the effect of the fall, that is sin in other words, will be removed completely. Uh, and sin introduced uh, death. Uh, sin introduced uh, illness and the fact that we, we live in, uh, not in harmony with one another. All of those things will be removed and there will be perfect peace and perfect harmony and health and, uh, and we may still explore uh, the world and still continue to work, but we'll do it with a new understanding of what it means to live in the presence of God. Even right now, God expects us to live in His presence. But, but the new reality will bring a brand new understanding of what it means to live in the presence of God. Because there will be no sin uh, and we will live in perfect conditions. One quick little thing that we need to get clear in our minds is that we will not be perfect. Because only God is perfect and nobody else. If we are perfect, then we are equal to God. And so even in heaven one day, in the new reality, we're not going to be perfect. We are still created beings. Um, we will be like the angels. We will see God face to face, uh, as it were, but we will be very aware of the, the new presence of God or, or the presence of God in a very different way. So here are some of the core truths. I have highlighted some of the di differences among uh, different Christians and, and uh, scholars, but there, there's a certain core of belief that is uh, something that I believe we should hold dear. The first is that Jesus is coming again. I have no doubt in my mind about that. We don't know the exact date of His coming. And anybody who suggests a date is simply wrong. They are false. They, they are false teachers. You should not believe them. And so it doesn't matter what date they say or predict and how well they have worked it out. Jesus said we don't know the date. And so that's something we most of us agree on. We must be watchful and ready for His return, so we must be ready at all times, whenever He is coming. And the church must be busy extending the kingdom until He arrives, until He comes back. And Christians saved by God's grace will spend eternity in the presence of God in a perfect relationship with Him. Non-believers will be judged and they will be sent to hell. And as I pointed out, different people hold different views around that. Some of the common errors that we find in the... Um, around eschatology, the predictions of the second coming. I've said that a few times. They are simply wrong. Denying that Christ is coming again. There are different variations of this particular view. Some people believe that, that God has come for me. The second coming has already happened in me. Now, 
the, the New Testament is clear that the second coming has not yet taken place because we're not living in that new reality. So denying Jesus' second coming is wrong. And then teaching that Jesus already came in some way or the other. Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists have variations of this view, not exactly, but some variations. While, and this is a quote from Wikipedia, the Rastafari um, movement, and you may not uh, know this, but it's actually a religious movement, the Rastafarians, um, but they believe that Hail Selassie is the second coming. He is the, the second coming. Uh, he embodied the second coming when he became the emperor of Ethiopia. But is also expected, he is also expected to return a second time to initiate the apocalyptic day of judgment. There will be another chance of salvation. Uh, I believe it's, it's purely wrong. I don't think, I don't believe the Bible is... Uh, is unclear on the fact that when Jesus comes back, it is it. There is no second chance in order to get uh, to know God or Jesus. We have our chance right now. That, that, again, that story of the rich man and Lazarus, um, where, we, where Abraham made it uh, abundantly clear to the rich man. He's had his chance, and uh, his brothers who live on earth, they have the law of Moses and the prophets, and they, they need to be guided by that. So their chance is in this life, to find Jesus. And then another wrong belief, and I think most of us will recognize that immediately, when Muslims say that Jesus is going to come back, but he will convert the whole world to Islam, um, and that is obviously wrong. And then uh, another view held by some Christians even, and that is that Jesus will rebuild the temple and reinstitute the sacrificial uh, priesthood. Now, Jesus is the final sacrifice, so I see no need for the temple or a sacrificial system because Jesus fulfilled all of that in the, uh, all of those prophecies of the Old Testament. There's some songs that we sing, and I, uh, I, I do believe in our, in our modern worship movement there is not enough about the second coming. There's a huge amount about our own Christian lives, our worship, our praise of God, all necessary things. Uh, if you turn back the clock, just after the World War, uh, those who were born during that same time and in the 50s and 60s, you will find songs written during that time reflecting heaven much more. There are a lot more about heaven and the future in those songs. And then in the 70s and 80s, with the modern worship movement uh, coming into being, a lot less emphasis on the second coming, a lot more about how we enjoy Jesus uh, how we love Jesus and how we need to praise Jesus. And so it will continue to be in church history until the Lord comes back. I want to encourage you to think about how you really feel about the second coming. Do you need to make any adjustments in your belief or expectations? And, and maybe to find out what your pastor's view is. Now that you have a little bit of an understanding, go and throw around some words like, are you pre or pre-trip or pre-whatever it is or amil? Uh, what is your view? Um, and, and please don't judge him uh, for that because uh, it, everybody has their uh, right to believe whatever they believe. And, and then I want to encourage you, last of all, uh, to review this module. I have given you an overview every single week, try, trying to um, do a revision every week. But there is a big picture here. That's the title of this course. There is a big picture, and I want to encourage you to go back to that big picture. Many of the details in Scripture we can only understand if we have an understanding of the bigger picture. Not that the Bible is a closed book, uh, not by a long shot, but it does help to have the bigger picture in mind when you start reading the detail things in the Bible. So here is a statement of belief based on what we have done in this course. I believe in God who created everything and revealed Himself as ruler of the universe. I believe that the triune God made humankind in His image, that mankind sinned against God, but that God provided salvation to sinners who believe in Him. I believe in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. He was born of a virgin, preached the coming of the kingdom of God, and died and rose again to bring uh, the kingdom of God into effect. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He came at Pentecost to bring sinners to Christ and to empower Christians to advance the kingdom of God. I believe in the church as God's healing community made up of believers and left on earth to fulfill God's mission. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again to bring all of God's purposes to completion in a new heaven and a new earth. 
I want to thank you for attending this course and trust that God will use this to bring you closer, to draw you closer to Himself. Thank you for your patience and may the Lord bless you as you go. Let's just pray together as we bring this course to a close. Lord, we thank you once again for your self-revelation and that you have drawn us into a relationship with yourself. Thank you that you left us with the Word, the Bible. Thank you for Jesus Christ who is the living Word. Thank you for your Spirit who dwells in us. And thank you, Lord, that we can look forward to the day that you are going to come and fetch us to be with you forever. We thank you for this time together. I pray that you would bless our students and that you would draw every single one of us close to yourself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.